you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we're there in Ezekiel chapter number one. And like we've been announcing, we're starting a brand new book of the Bible tonight. And um, I'm always, it's always good uh, when you are at the beginning of a study. And I want to encourage you to be with us throughout the entire study of Ezekiel. It'd be wonderful if you were with us all 48 weeks that we were in the book of Ezekiel and uh, you'd really learn this book. And the truth of the matter is that some books are easier to read uh, than others. We're talking about books of the Bible. So some are easier to read, some are easier to study, some are more enjoyable, and some are more neglected. And I would definitely say that the book of Ezekiel is a book that is often neglected. It's not one that is often read by Christians, and it's even less preached by pastors. You can't find a lot of preaching out of the book of Ezekiel. And the reason for it is because the book of Ezekiel, in my opinion, and you know many Christians that have studied the Word of God would agree, that it is one of the most difficult, if not the most difficult book in uh, the Bible. So when, you, when we study Ezekiel, you know, and as we begin this study and spend the next 48 weeks going uh, one chapter a week studying through the book, you know, just realize that we are probably dealing with the hardest book in the Word of God. And after that, you know, it's all downhill from there. You know, it all gets easier uh, after Ezekiel. But what we're going to do is we're going to learn what we can, you know. And here's what we're not going to do. We're not going to worry about the parts that we don't understand. Because I will tell you right now, you know, there are definitely parts in the book of Ezekiel that I don't understand. And that it's not that, you know, you say, oh, well, could we study it? And we're, I'm definitely studying it and reading and cross-referencing and all that. I think there are per parts in the book of Ezekiel that nobody can understand, that nobody will ever understand until we get to heaven and God will explain it to us. And I, I want to just read a verse for you out of Deuteronomy as we get started. You don't have to turn there. I'm going to read this verse to you, but you'll probably end up memorizing it by the time we're done with the book of Ezekiel because I think it'll kind of become a theme for us through the book of Ezekiel. Deuteronomy 29 and verse 29 says this, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. And as we study books like Ezekiel or Isaiah or uh, hard books to understand, you know, we need to realize that the secret things belong unto the Lord our God. And where people get themselves into trouble is when they start trying to, you know, just make stuff up. You know, they, they look at things they don't understand. They just start making stuff up. And look, we're, there, there are going to be parts of this book that we're going to look at and we're going to say the secret things belong unto the Lord our God. We're going to worry about those things which are revealed. Those things belong unto us, the things that we can understand. Why? That we may do all the words of this law. We always study the Bible, not just for knowledge, but for application, so that we can understand how to apply it. And even in a book like Ezekiel, there's much application that can uh, be done. So let's go ahead and just jump right into the, uh, into the chapter uh, tonight. If you look at verse 1 there. Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 1 says this, Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I, and this is of course Ezekiel speaking, and I would encourage you to definitely take notes as we're studying through the book of Ezekiel, and if you don't mind writing in your Bible, you can take notes right in your Bible. But here Ezekiel is speaking. I want you to notice just first of all, he says, as I, notice what he says, was among the captives by the river Kibar. I want you to notice that Ezekiel was in captivity. Ezekiel himself was among the captives in Babylon. Notice verse number two. He says, in the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity. He tells us when he went into captivity. Now keep your place there in the book of Ezekiel. That's obviously our text for tonight, but I want you to go with me just real quickly to 2 Chronicles chapter number 36. I want to explain to you something about the captivity. 2 Chronicles 36 in the Old Testament, you've got all those first and second books. They're all clustered together. 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles. Find 2 Chronicles 36 and let me show you something about Ezekiel's captivity. He tells us and right at the beginning of the book that he was among the captives. He was one of the captives. And he came in, the, in, the Bible says, in the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity. A lot of people don't understand, but when we talk about the captivity of the children of Israel, if you remember, the children of Israel had a kingdom that was divided into two kingdoms. You had the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom became known as, you know, what was the ten tribes of Israel. The southern kingdom became known as the tribe of Judah or the southern kingdom of Judah. 
Many years before Babylon came, the Assyrians took the northern kingdom captive. That's where they mingled with them, and eventually in the New Testament, we have that people known as the Samaritans. The Babylonians would later on come, and they would capture the southern kingdom of Israel. That's where we get, of course, our stories of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But what you need to understand is that captivity of Judah happened in three different stages, or three different waves. It didn't happen all at once. It happened in three different uh, uh, stages. And I want to show that to you just real quickly in Second Chronicles 36. If you look at verse 5, the Bible says this, Jehoiakim. Now, Jehoiakim is the, is the first king that is basically taken into captivity. Notice it says, Jehoiakim was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 11 years in Jerusalem, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. Against him, talking about Jehoiakim, came up Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and bound him in fetters, notice, to carry him to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar also carried the vessels of the house of the Lord to Babylon and put them in the temple at Babylon. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and the abominations which he did and that which was found in him, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. And notice, Jehoiakim, his son, reigned in his stead. Now notice verse 9. Jehoiakim, now remember, in Ezekiel chapter number 1 and verse 2, we're told that in the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of Jehoiakim's captivity. So Jehoiakim gets taken into uh, Babylon, carried into Babylon, and then his son becomes king of the nation of Judah. Verse 9 says this, Jehoiakim was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned three months and ten days in Jerusalem. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And when the year was expired, notice, the king Nebuchadnezzar sent and brought him to Babylon. So that's the second wave or the second stage of the captivity with the goodly vessels of the house of the Lord and made Zedekiah, his brother, king over Judah and Jerusalem. So I want you to notice that Ezekiel goes into captivity during the second wave of that captivity. He didn't go with Jehoiakim, but he went with Jehoiakim. And here's what you need to understand. Zedekiah becomes king, and Zedekiah stays in Israel, and there are still people, there's yet coming a third wave of captives. And this is where we begin the book of Ezekiel, where you have Ezekiel already in captivity. But sometimes people get confused because they say, yeah, but he's talking about the fact that, you know, the nation of Israel is going to come into captivity. Uh, is that a contradiction? And it's not a contradiction because of the fact that the captivity happened in three different waves. And he is prophesying of yet a third wave that will happen with Zedekiah. And if you remember the story of Zedekiah, he gets his eyes plucked out and all of that. Look at verse 10. And when the year was expired, 2 Chronicles 36 and verse 10, King Nebuchadnezzar sent and brought him to Babylon with the goodly vessels of the house of the Lord and made Zedekiah his brother king over Judah and Jerusalem. Verse 11, Zedekiah was one and twenty years old when he began to reign and he reigned eleven years in Jerusalem and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord his God and humbled not himself before Jeremiah the prophet speaking from the mouth of the Lord. And keep in mind also that Jeremiah and Ezekiel are contemporaries. One is uh, prophesying from captivity while one is still prophesying in the southern kingdom of Judah. Skip down to verse number 17, 2 Chronicles 36, verse 17. Therefore he, now the he there is referring to God, brought upon them the king of the Chaldees, who slew their young men with the sword in, their, in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion upon the young men or the maiden, old men or him that uh, stooped for age. He gave them all into his hand, and all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king and of his princes. Notice, all these he brought to Babylon, and they burnt the house of God, and break down the wall of Jerusalem, and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire, and destroyed all the goodly vessels. So I want you to notice that during this third wave is when the temple actually gets destroyed, the walls are destroyed, and we know that 70 years later, when uh, Nehemiah and Ezra return to the land from captivity, they obviously rebuild the temple and rebuild the wall. So I want you to just kind of have some context into the book of Ezekiel and realize that he is in captivity, yet he is prophesying about yet more captivity because it happened in 
three different waves with Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, and Zedekiah. Go back to the book of Ezekiel and look at verse number 1 again. I want you to show you just one more thing in verse 1. Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 1, Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I, Ezekiel, was among the captives by the river Kibar, that, I want you to notice what it says, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. And this is really where the book of Ezekiel begins. What we're about to study in the rest of this chapter is basically a vision that Ezekiel got from God as the heavens were opened and he begins to see these heavenly creatures and he begins to see these uh, wonderful things that we're going to learn all about tonight. Look at verse 3. The word of the Lord came expressly. I, I, I don't know, but I think that's a unique phrase in the word of God. I couldn't find anywhere else where it says that the word of God came expressly. The word expressly means clearly or specifically. Unto Ezekiel, I want you to notice the priest. I want you to notice that Ezekiel was a priest who became a prophet, similar to Samuel. Remember, Samuel was a priest who became a prophet. Ezekiel is the same thing. The Bible tells us the word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzai, in the land of the Chaldeans. And I want you to notice, again, by the river Kibar, and the hand of the Lord was there upon him. Now, it's interesting that this river is mentioned because there's a very famous psalm that deals with the Babylonian captivity that also talks about the rivers of Babylon. I just want to show you that to you real quickly. Keep your place there in Ezekiel. Go to Psalm 137. Psalm 137. And when you get to Psalms, do me a favor and put a ribbon or a bookmark or something there because we're going to leave Psalms and we're going to come back to it. There's going to be uh, uh, several books that we're going to go back and forth with tonight. I hope you're ready to study the Word of God because you can't read Ezekiel without studying and cross-referencing. We're going to go to the book of Psalms. We're going to go to Isaiah. We're going to go to Revelation. There's other places we're going to go to, but those are the three primary ones we're going to go to. So when you get there, put your place there. Psalm 137, look at verse 1. Psalm 137 and verse 1 says this, By the rivers of Babylon... Notice this psalm begins talking about captivity. Psalm 137, verse 1. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us songs that they wasted us. Uh, they that wasted us required of us myrrh, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. And they responded, How shall we sing the Lord's song? in a strange land. So I want you to notice that the, you got this Psalm uh, 137 talking about the captives by the rivers of Babylon, you know, being asked to sing songs from Zion, to sing songs from Israel. And they're, of course, discouraged because they're in captivity and they're saying, how shall we sing the Lord's songs in a strange land? And then when you get to Ezekiel, who is actually one of those captives, he talks about the fact that he got a vision from God and the word of the Lord was revealed unto him and, it's, uh, and, he, and he brings it up a couple of times that it's by the river Kibar. So just something interesting there, a nice cross-reference for you to have. Go back to Ezekiel chapter 1, look at verse 4. And I looked and behold, a whirlwind. Now a whirlwind is like a tornado. He says, a whirlwind came out of the north. And remember, we're, we're, we're getting into his vision now. The heavens have opened, and he sees a whirlwind that came out of the north, a great cloud, and a fire enfolding itself, and a uh, brightness was about it, that means around it. So he, he sees, you know, well, let me finish reading. And out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. So he sees the heavens opened, you know, just try to get this, because I think sometimes people, they get confused with these books, and they read it, and they're like, I don't get it. But you just have to kind of slow down and, and put some flesh, you know, to the reading. Just kind of put yourself there. You have Ezekiel by a river. The word of the Lord comes expressly to him. He sees visions of God, visions that came from God. The heavens are open, and when the heavens are open, he sees a whirlwind. He sees this tornado, but it's got a great cloud around it, and it has fire enfolding itself. It has brightness all about it, all around it. He sees fire in the midst thereof. Notice verse 5. Also, 
out of the midst thereof, out of the midst of what? Out of the midst of this whirlwind with this cloud, with the fire enfolding itself, he says, try to get this picture. He looks up to heaven. He sees, I, I don't know what this looks like. You know, I've never seen this before. I hope I never see it, you know, but he sees a whirlwind on fire with brightness. And then in verse 5, he says, also out of the midst thereof, out of that whirlwind that's on fire, came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance, that they had the likeness of a man. So out of this whirlwind, he sees these four creatures flying out. I mean, imagine being Ezekiel and having to be the guy that writes these things down. You know, you'd probably write something that none of us would understand also. You know, and but, but this is the vision that he sees. You know, he the heavens are open, whirlwind on fire, enfolding itself, brightness round about, and then from the whirlwind comes these living creatures. Now, in Ezekiel chapter one, he refers to them as living creatures. We know that these are cherubim. And the reason we know that's because Ezekiel tells us this later in the book. And let's just look at it real quickly. Go to Ezekiel chapter 10. In Ezekiel 1, he calls them living creatures. He doesn't call them. Uh, uh, cherubim, but in Ezekiel chapter 10 and verse 15, if you want to write down a cross reference, he says, Ezekiel 10, 15, and the cherubims were lifted up. Notice what he says. This is the living creature. That's what he said in Ezekiel 1 and verse 5. Now he tells us that the cherubims, this is the living creature that I saw by the river Kibar, or some people pronounce it Chibar, you know, whatever, however that's supposed to be pronounced. But he says there in Ezekiel 10, 15, we're told that these creatures that he saw, they are uh, cherubims. They are cherubims is what the Bible calls them. Now, the Roman Catholic Church has made, you know, this lie that cherubims are like these fat little naked babies with wings, but we're going to see tonight that that's not what the Bible teaches about cherubims um, at all, all right? So keep your place here in Ezekiel. Go to Revelation just real quickly. Revelation chapter 4. When you get to Revelation, do me a favor, put a ribbon or a bookmark there because that's one of the books that we're going to go back and forth from. You should have your place in Psalms and Ezekiel and in Revelation. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 5, I want you to notice that we have, the, we have living creatures, these heavenly creatures in Revelation also. Now, let me just say this, and we're going to look, see this later on in the study. In Revelation 4, they're not cherubim. They are uh, most likely seraphim, and I'll prove that to you, and, and we'll look at that. But, but for now, I just want you to notice Revelation 4 and verse 5 says this, and out of the throne. Now, in Revelation 4, we have, of course, John, who's been caught up in the Spirit, and he has a vision of uh, you know, the throne of God and of heavenly places as well. And he sees this, and out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Verse 6, and before the throne there was a sea of glass, like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts. I want you to notice that word beast there. Full of eyes before and behind. Now, keep your place in Revelation. We're going to come back to it, but you can go back to Ezekiel. I want you to notice that in Revelation, they were called beasts. Now, a word, the word beast is basically uh, our word animal. That's what the word beast means, you know. It's an animal. And in Ezekiel, they're called living creatures. In Revelation, they're called beasts or animals. I want you to understand that these creatures are not human. These are angels that are called animals. They're called beasts. They're living creatures, but they're not Human. Look at verse 5 of Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 5. Also, out of the midst thereof came, notice these words, the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. And what I want you to understand is that between verses 5 and 24 of the book of, e of, of Ezekiel chapter number 1, he's basically going to spend you know, most of this chapter describing to us the appearance of these four creatures. The likeness of these four creatures. And this is probably, cherubims are mentioned all throughout the Bible. You can find many references to them. But Ezekiel chapter 1 is probably where we get the most details about these animals, these angelic beasts, these living creatures. Uh, so that's what we're going to spend most of our time in tonight, just looking at how he describes it. Now, we're going to cover every verse in this chapter, but we're going to skip around a little bit because we're going to, uh, he repeats himself a lot, so we're going to go to all the places kind of by theme and what he says. I want you to notice the first thing he says is that they look like a man. Notice again, verse 5 there. Also, out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. First thing he wants to tell us is they had the likeness 
of a man. Now remember, they're not a man. They're not human. These are not human, and you'll see that as we study it. But he says they had the likeness of a man, meaning if you would have seen them afar off, you might have, you know, th uh, thought they were a man. And what I believe that he means by that is that these, these animals have the appearance of a man in the sense that they're built like a human being. And what I mean by that is that they probably had a torso, they had a head, they had two arms, they had two legs. Their bodies were built in the likeness of a man. Look at verse 6. And everyone had four faces and everyone had four wings. We're going to come back to that. And their feet were straight feet and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot and they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. We're going to come back to all of that. Look at verse 8. And they had the hands of a man. So I want you to notice that they had hands of a man. He said they had the likeness of a man. So, you know, they obviously have a head, they have arms, they have legs. That's what he's referring to. Now let's look at what he, how he begins to describe these, you know, angels. These are angels, these cherubims, how he describes them. First he tells us, you know, they kind of look like men in the sense that their bodies, their head, their, their shape, their torso, their arms, their legs. But then he begins to give us descriptions that are not human at all. Look at verse 6. He says, and everyone had four faces. We'll come back to that. And everyone, notice what he says, had four wings, all right? So usually when we think of angels or when the world thinks of angels, they think of, you know, a man with, with wings. But, you know, really when the Bible talks to us about angels that look like men or angels that were human beings, you don't ever see them described as having wings. But these cherubims are the ones that are described as having wings. The seraphims are the ones uh, that are described as having wings. And in Zechariah, there's a vision of, of, of these spirits that look like women and they have wings like a stork. But, you know, really, this is the angel. When you want to think of an angel, you know, some of you have your little angel uh, idol in your house or whatever, you know, and you got your little porcelain angel, and it's like a woman with long hair, and she's got her wings. Well, you should probably change that to this uh, image that we're going to look at now. But it might not, you know, it might, like, scare all of your guests if you have this thing on there. But I want you to notice that this thing, this cherubim, had four wings. Notice, skip down to verse 9. Their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. They went every one straight forward. Thus were their, uh, look, look verse 11, skip down to verse 11. Thus were their faces, and notice, we're just focusing on the wings right now. Their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one were joined one to another, and two covered their bodies. I want you to notice that these uh, cherubim had four wings, but the wings are divided into two different pairs. You've got two pairs that are stretched outward, and then you've got two pair that covered their bodies. And by the way, let me say this. You will find that anything that is connected to God, whether it's human beings or angelic beings or the Lord Jesus Christ himself, God always seems to go out of his way to express to us that their bodies are covered. You know, they're not just running around naked. Even the angelic uh, angels had these wings to cover their nakedness and to cover their body. That might be a good thing for you to remember, you know, during the summer months. God wants you to cover your nakedness. Look at verse 22, Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 22. He says this, And the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creatures was as the color of the terrible crystal stretched forth over their heads above. Verse 23, And under, under the firmament was, uh, excuse me, were, notice what it says, their wings straight and one toward another. Everyone had two which covered on this side, and everyone had two which covered on that side their bodies. And when they went, I heard the noise of their wings like the noise of great waters as the voice of the Almighty. Now look, it doesn't say he heard the voice of the Almighty. He said when he heard their wings, it was as the voice of the Almighty, as the noise of great, great waters, the voice of speech, as the noise of an host. When they stood, notice, they let down their wings. So I want you to notice, what are we talking about? We're talking about this creature, right? It's flying to him out of this, you know, fiery tornado that he sees. And then he sees, he tells us that he sees that they had four wings. Two were joined together in a pair. Two were joined together in a pair. When they're flying, they stretch out, and, and, and you got two covering their bodies. Two of the wings spread out to fly, and the other two cover their bodies. So he explains, he, he shows us there, and he talks us about their wings. But let's go back to their faces. Look, look at verse 6, Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 6. 
And everyone had, notice what it says, four faces. Now they've got one head, but they have four faces. Now how does that work? You know, I don't know. I've never seen one of these. If I had to guess, in my opinion, based on how they move, and we'll see this later on, is that they've got a face on every side of their head. You know, we've got a head with four sides, but we've got a face on the front side of our uh, head. These beasts had four faces. They probably have a face on every side of their head. And notice the faces. Look at verse 10. As the likeness of their... Uh, as of... Uh, as for, excuse me, as for the likeness of their faces, they four had, notice, he's going to tell us the types of faces they had. Number one, the face of a man. So on one side of their head, they do have a face that looks like a man. It looks like a human. And number two, the face of a lion. So on one side of their head, they have a face that looks like a lion. On the right side, and they four had... Number three, the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had, number four, the face of an eagle. So you've got, you know, an eagle, a lion, uh, you've got an ox, and you've got a man. And it's, you know, it's interesting, and when I, when I look at that, and, and I've heard other people say this, and I, and I would agree with it, it's interesting, you, you know, why did God pick those four animals? But it, it seems like, you know, uh, uh, excuse me, three animals and a, a human face, which humans are not animals, but why would he do that? You know, I think that he did that because a lion, when you think of a lion, you know, a lion's like the king of the wild animals. When it comes to wild animals, the lion is the mightiest, the strongest. And then you've got an eagle. Well, an eagle is also, you know, the mightiest and the strongest of the flying animals, of the animals that are flying in the air. Then you've got an ox. An ox is probably the mightiest and the strongest of the domesticated animals, the ones that uh, humans have brought into their homes and taken care of. And then you've got the face of a man, which is the greatest creature that God ever created. Um, you know, obviously, he gave dominion of all, of all the earth to mankind. Look at verse 11. Thus were their faces. So he says this is what their faces were like. They were the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of an ox, the face of an eagle. Now I want you to, I want you to notice something interesting because in Ezekiel chapter 10, remember in Ezekiel 10 is where he told us uh, that they were cherubims? Go, go back to Ezekiel chapter 10 just real quickly. Ezekiel chapter 10 and look at verse number 14. Ezekiel 10, 14 says this. Now, in Ezekiel 10, 14, he's describing these, these cherubim again. But I want you to notice he describes their faces basically the same way, but there's one difference, and it's kind of interesting. Ezekiel 10, 14 says this. And everyone had four faces, right? The first face was as the face of a cherub. Now, in Ezekiel 1, he didn't tell us the face of a cherub. He said the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of an ox, the face of an eagle. In Ezekiel 10, he tells us that one has the face of a cherub, the second face was the face of a man, so that matches Ezekiel 1.10, the face of a man. And the third face of a lion, so that matches Ezekiel 1.10, the face of a lion. And the fourth face, the face of an eagle, that matches Ezekiel 1.10, the face of an eagle. But in Ezekiel 1.10, he tells us that one had the face of an ox, and then here he tells us that one has the face of a cherub. Now we're looking at an animal that a, a creature that is a cherub. So what is, you know, what is the face of a cherub look like? Well, I think the Bible's trying to show us here that the face of a cherub looks like an ox, which is why he uses those interchangeably. And if I had to guess, I would say that this is his primary face. You know, the one that's facing forward is the one that looks like a cherub or the one that looks like an ox. So these Angelic beings each had four faces. They have four wings, but they also have four faces. The face of the cherub seems to be the face of the ox or the primary face, which is why it's called the face of a cherub, which is the entire animal we're describing. These are similar to another heavenly beast and another creature that is called a seraphim. Did you keep your place in Revelation? Now, in Revelation chapter 4, go, go, go there real quickly. Revelation chapter 4. In Revelation chapter 4, remember, we have the vision of, of the throne room of God there with John. And there are four beasts that are described there too. They're described a little differently though. And the reason for that is because they're not the same creature. 
They're very similar, but they're not the same. In the same way that, like, you know, on this earth, we have lions and uh, tigers and leopards and, you know, house cats. You know, they're all felines, but they're, they're, they're all different. Now, they're similar, but they're, you know, a tiger is different than a lion. And I think that these cherubim and also the seraphim that we're going to look at right now, they're very similar, but they're different creatures. Revelation chapter 4, and again, we don't know a lot about how all this works, and one day we'll get to heaven and figure it all out. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 6 says this, And before the throne there was a sea of glass, like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Notice how these four beasts are described. Verse 7, The first beast was like a lion. Now, the cherubim are described as having four faces. Each beast had these four faces. These beasts are described as there's four of them, and each of them has one of these faces. Now, maybe all of them had all four faces. I don't know. That's not what's described here. He tells us that each had one. Maybe he was looking at all of them from the front and just saw the one face on them, or maybe just each one of these beasts had one of these. But notice verse 7, the first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf, the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. Again, all of the faces match. As the cherubims, you got the lion, you got the man, you got the eagle, but there's, again, a problem. Remember, Ezekiel 1, we had an ox. Ezekiel 10, we had the face of a cherub. Here, we have the second beast was like a calf, all right? So what's a calf? A calf is a baby ox, you know? It's, a, it's that the, those cows and bulls and ox, when they're young, they're called calf, so that's what it's referring to there. But look at verse 8. Here's where... It's different than the cherubim. And the four beasts had each of them, notice, six wings about him. So the cherubims had four wings. These animals have six wings. The cherubims had four faces. These are four animals that happen to have the same four faces. Notice, and the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy. Holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Could you imagine, you know, one day when we step into the throne room of heaven and we will see these four beasts, these four angelic creatures with the face of a lion and the face of an ox or a calf or a cherub or whatever, you know, the face of a man and the face of an eagle with these six wings. And all they do day and night, notice, they rest not day and night. All they do day and night for all eternity is say, holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. And praising our God. And by the way, that's where we get the song. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. It's quoted from Revelation chapter 4. And of course, the three holies there are a reference to the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. All of them having praise given to them from these six-winged uh, angelic creatures. Now, Revelation chapter 4 is not the only place where these are mentioned. They're also mentioned in the book of Isaiah. Go to Isaiah with me, Isaiah chapter number 6. Now, if you kept your place in Ezekiel, if you go backwards, you're going to go past Lamentations, past Jeremiah, into the book of Isaiah. When you get to Isaiah, do me a favor and put a ribbon or a bookmark there because we're going to leave it and we're going to come back to it, all right? So you should have your place in Ezekiel. You should have your place in Psalms. You should have your place in Revelation. And you should have your place in Isaiah. We're going to go back and forth between those books for a little bit. But let me show you, uh, you, you know, why, why we call these beasts seraphims as opposed to uh, cherubims. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I was also I was also the Lord sitting. Uh, excuse me, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne. I love these words. How Isaiah says this. He says that he saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple, and above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. Remember, Revelation four eight said that each of them had six wings about him. Well, here Isaiah tells us that each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. Notice verse 3. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy 
is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So I want you to notice that in Isaiah chapter 6, these, uh, these angelic beings with six wings are referred to as seraphim, which is why in Revelation chapter 4, we assume that the same four beasts with the same six wings that are basically saying the same thing, holy, 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 are also seraphim. These are different than the cherubim that we are studying in Ezekiel chapter 1, but they're worth mentioning because they're very obviously very similar, and it's just a different type of beast, uh, you know, a different type of angel that's described in Scripture. Go back to Ezekiel chapter 1. And I've heard people say that, you know, it may just be, since these two references are just these four that are saying holy, 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 it may just be that those are the only four that exist. And, you know, we don't know if that's true or not, but that could very well be the case. Ezekiel chapter 1, look at verse number 7. Let's go back to the description. You know, he described their faces, he described their wings, he kind of described their bodies. Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 7, now he's going to describe their feet. He says, and their feet, so like men, they've got two legs. Two arms, two hands, you know, ahead, but their feet are different. Notice, and their feet were straight feet. Now, when he says they're straight feet, what he's talking about is that they, they, their feet do not form an L like a human foot does. You know, like our, foots are, our feet are like an L. He's saying their feet are straight. There's nothing sticking out, and he explains more of it. He says, and the sole of their foot was like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. So when you look at like a calf or, you know, that type of animal, it's, it has like a hoof, right? So it's just a straight foot. There's no L shape to it. That's what he's describing. So think about this, you know. You've got this beast. It's like a human being. It's got a head and a torso and arms and, and legs. But its legs are like hoofs, like a calf, you know. And it's got four wings, you know, two covering its body and two that it uses to fly. Its head has four faces, the face of an ox or a cherub, the face of an eagle and a lion and the face of a man. And this is the animal that he's describing. And by the way, you know, sometimes people look at these things and they'll say, oh, this kind of reminds me like, you know, Greek mythology where you had like a half horse and a half human or you had like a lion with wings, you know, whatever. And you say, could it be that the Bible got it from, you know, Greek mythology? And here's the truth. Satan got it from God. You know, all of these Hercules, you know, as obviously a knockoff of, uh, of Samson. You know, every, all, everything the world has is just Satan trying to mock at or trying to copy the Word of God. But this is not mythology. We're going to get to heaven one day and we're going to look at these things, you know. And, you know, some of us are going to talk to them. Some of us may not. I don't know. But notice how he describes them. Look at verse 7 again. He gives us another description. Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 7, and their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their foot was like the sole of a calf's foot. And notice, they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. That word burnished means polished. He said they sparkled like polished brass. Look at verse 13. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals. You know, you look at a, at, a, at a burning coal, they kind of glow. You know, they're, they're, they've got that yellow and red to it. And it says that's what they looked like. They looked like the appearance of burning coals of fire and like the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures and notice the fire was bright and out of the fire went forth lightning. So these animals also, they sparkle, they shine, they glow like a coal that's on fire, like a bright fire. Now in verse 14, he begins to give us another description and to me this is probably the most interesting uh, of the descriptions. Look at verse 14, he says, and the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. We'll come back to verse 14, actually. But look at verse 15. Now, as I beheld the living creatures, behold. Now, he begins to tell us about these wheels. Notice he says, one wheel upon the earth by the living creature with his four faces. Verse 16. And the appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of a barrel. And they four had one likeness and their appearance and their work was as it were. Notice, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. 
When they went, they went upon their four sides, and they turned not when they went. As for their rings, they were uh, so high that they were dreadful, and their rings were full of eyes round about uh, them four. And when the living creatures went, notice verse 19, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. And whithersoever the Spirit was to go, they went. Hither was their spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. And when those went, these went. And when those stood, these stood. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creatures was, notice these words, in the wheels. The Bible tells us that these living creatures had wheels. Now, I'm going to give you, you know, my thoughts on this, and here's the honest truth. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. You know, we really don't know or understand, you know, how these things are or how they can be, but let me just give you some thoughts. Uh, We're told here that at least these cherubims, maybe not all cherubims, but at least these cherubims have wheels. Some people describe the wheels, especially when it says, like in verse 16, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. I've heard this taught in many different ways. You know, some people describe the wheel in the middle of a wheel like a gyroscope. If you're familiar with a gyroscope, you know, it's a wheel in the middle of a wheel. Uh, Some people describe it like a planet with rings, like Saturn or Neptune. You know, others describe it like those spinner rims, you know, that you uh, ghetto people have or whatever. Some of you have them. Um, You know, I I don't know. You know, if I had to guess, I would say that it's probably, you know, when I envision this and because of the way these animals move, uh, these, I, I would say, and this is just totally my opinion, that it's probably like the rings of a planet, you know. And the other reason for that is because that's something we see in nature, you know. But I, I envision that they use these wheels to travel, you know. I, and again, this is just my opinion, but I envision that you've got this, this wheel that is not really facing forward or backward. It's kind of like a ball, like a planet. I know flat earthers are going to, I'm going to lose them there. But um, like a ball, like a planet with a ring around it, and somehow that ring keeps that ball in place, and then that ball just kind of turns in whatever direction it wants to go. And we're going to see that here in a minute. Again, that's totally my opinion. I don't know. Nobody knows, all right, (laughs) until we get to heaven. We're going to get to heaven. We're going to look at it, and we'll be like, oh, yeah, you know. Turns out it was like the spinner rims or whatever, you know. (laughs) But, you know, we're we're just going to look at it, and it's going to be... It. Now, here's the thing. You know, I want to give you an example of this because we do see something similar. The wheels, you know, I do believe they're wheels, but I think, you know, it may also be a reference to the rotation because we do so, see something like this in nature. Uh, you know, a year ago or two years ago, I don't remember now, I, I did a whole series on evolution. And when we were t- studying evolution and I was looking into it, I, I learned about this, uh, you know, uh, this, this thing in nature, it's a bacteria, and it's called a flagellum. Do you guys remember learning about that when we're talking about the, the uh, you know, nature and, and how God created things? A flagellum is a whip-like structure in cells that allows a cell to move. The flagella are able to propel itself by spinning their tail like a, uh, uh, by spinning their tail either in uh, a rotation that is clockwise or counterclockwise, and depending on how they rotate it, they'll propel, you know, forward or backward or, or whatever. This is how they move. So it may be that these wheels are some sort of like helicopter propelling thing. You know, again, I don't know. You don't know. None of us know. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. But, you know, it's fun to kind of think about it, you know. And then, of course, here's where you lose all the UFO you know, fanatics, right? And they're like, UFOs in the Bible, you know, or whatever. And yeah, I'm not going to talk about that. You know, I'm, I'm sure that some people have seen spirits and, you know, thought they were UFOs. I'm also sure that some people have just been on drugs and thought that they saw UFOs. But these cherubims have wheels. These cherubims have wheels that are described for us here. Now, I want to show you something interesting. Go to Psalm 68. If you kept your place in Psalm. And if you think of wheels, you know, what would, when you think of a wheel here, what do you think of? You think of like a car, right? Maybe during the time of, of Ezekiel, you'd think of like a chariot. Some people um, have taught, and, and I, again, this is, I don't know, 
but that these cherubim are like chariots for God, that they're actually God's mode of transportation. And we understand that God is omnipresent and omnipotent, and we get all that. You know, but let me show you a verse that kind of might you know, uh, be a proof text or something like that. Psalm 68, verse 17. Notice what the Bible says. The chariots of God, all right? So does God have chariots? The answer is yes. Psalm 68, 17 tells us that. The chariots of God are 20,000. Even thousands, notice, of angels. So according to Psalm 68, 17, does God have chariots? The answer is yes. What are his chariots? They're angels. He says, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them, as in Sinai, in the holy place. So if God uses cherubims like a chariot, then it makes sense that they would have wheels, right? So we're learning that these cherubim have wheels. We learn in Psalm 68 that God has chariots that are angels, or he uses angels as chariots. It might be a reference to these Cherubim. Go to Psalm 18. Let me just give you one more kind of cross-reference for that. Psalm 18, and look at verse number 10. Psalm 18 and verse number uh, 10. <clears throat> Psalm 18 and verse 10 says this, And he, this is the Lord, notice, rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. Here we're told that the Lord rode upon a cherub. All right, so, it, you know, I don't think it's too out there to, if, if we got a verse that says God rode a cherub, if we got verses that say God has chariots and they're angels, and we've got verses that tell us about angels that have wheels, you, you know, these cherubim may be God's uh, chariots, which is why they have wheels. Now, go back to Ezekiel, but go to Ezekiel chapter 28, just real quickly, and uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time in Ezekiel 28, but I just want to show you uh, something out of Ezekiel 28. Obviously, I'm going to preach a whole sermon on Ezekiel 28 when we get there in 28 weeks, all right? So make sure you stay tuned. But I want you to, to notice something, you know, because people might think, like, could, you know, would God really put, like, wheels on a, a, a creature, like a living creature, not a machine, you know, or something? But what's interesting is that in Ezekiel 28, we also learn about cherubs, and we learn about a cherub that has kind of like a mechanical you know, mechanical things in his body. Now, we're specifically learning about the devil. Because here's what you need to understand. Satan was an angel. And specifically, Ezekiel 28 tells us that he was a cherub. So these cherubims we're learning about in Ezekiel chapter 1, this is Satan, you know, which is interesting because, you know, all of these satanic cults always want to worship a calf or a cow or an ox, right? which is what a cherub has as a face. The Bible tells us that Satan, you know, uh, is like a lion seeking whom he may devour, which he has the face of a lion. You know, so those are all things that are kind of interesting. But look at Ezekiel 28 and look at verse number 13. And again, we'll develop all of this when we get to it, but let me just give it to you real quickly. Ezekiel 28, verse 13. He says, Thou has been in Eden, the garden of God. Now, there was three people that were in the garden of Eden. Well, four if you count the Lord, of course. But you've got Adam, you've got Eve, and who's our third? The serpent, right? The devil. Here, we're talking to someone that was in Eden. He says, Thou has been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, topaz, and the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of, notice, the workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes were prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Here God is speaking to Satan, and he's telling him, in your body I placed, you know, pipes. And tablets, a pipe, we're talking about like an organ that has pipes, you know. His body was created with something that you and I would call mechanical, you know, uh, but it was created to, you know, have music, which, by the way, this is one of the reasons Satan uses music so often to draw people away from God. He, he was created as a musical being. Notice the uh, last part of verse 13 again. He says, the workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes were prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways. He was the anointed cherub. He, he says, you are perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till 
iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. And he goes on and on talk about it. But this is, of course, talking about Satan, who was a cherub who sinned. But I want you to notice that this cherub had, you know, tablets and pipes that were created in his body. So it's not that, you know, if, if he's putting pipes and tablets in a cherub that is meant to produce music, it's not that absurd that he would put wheels on a cherub that is meant to be his chariot, you know? So I don't know. These are like hybrid or whatever. We see the flagellum who has rotors and whips and things, you know, uh, and motors, uh, but it's just all interesting. Again, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I understand how all of this works, but some things for you to think about. Go, go back to uh, Ezekiel chapter number 8. Uh, excuse me, chapter 1. Ezekiel chapter 1, look at verse 18. Let me give you another description. Ezekiel 1, 18. As for their rings, they were so high that they were dreadful, and their rings, notice, were full of eyes round about them. About them four. So they had these rings, and the rings were full of eyes. Now, if you kept your place in Revelation... Go, go back to Revelation chapter 4 just real quickly and look at verse number 6. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 6. And I apologize if we're going to go a little longer than we usually do on Wednesday night, but, you know, there's just so much here. Let's try to get it all covered. Revelation chapter 4, verse 6. Remember, these are seraphim, but I want you to notice how they're described the same way. Ezekiel 1.18 says they were full of eyes round about them for. Revelation 4.6 says, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts. Notice, full of eyes before and behind. You know, so you may not want to pet these things if they're just filled with eyes. You're going to poke it in its eye or something. I don't know. But uh, the first beast was like a lion. The second beast like a calf. The third beast had a face as a man. The fourth beast was like a flying eagle. Verse 8. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him. Notice, they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. So we're told that the seraphims are full of eyes within. They're full of eyes. You know, uh, these four beasts were full of eyes before and behind. And then the, uh, the cherubims are also full of eyes round about them, is what Ezekiel 1.18 says. Go back to Ezekiel chapter 1. So we basically went through all the description, right? I mean, that's, a, again, if you had an, uh, a little porcelain cherubim on your nightstand or on your fireplace, you might freak people out, you know. But these are the angelic beings that the Bible talks to us about. Now let's talk about their movements just real quickly. Ezekiel chapter 1, look at verse 9. Their wings were joined one to another. Notice, they turned not. This is something that's often referred to with these creatures. They turned not when they went. They went, everyone, straight forward. They always only ever go straight. They never turn. Look at verse 12. And they went, everyone, straight forward. Whether the Spirit was uh, to go. They went and they turned not when they went. Look at verse 17. When they went, they went upon their four sides. So they don't go on one side. Like you and I, we go forward, right? I've got my one side. I got, I'm going forward. If I want to go that way, what do I got to do? I got to turn around and go that way. It's very rare that people, you know, are just like, oh, yeah, how are you doing? And then, oh, brother so-and-so's back there. I want to go shake his hand. I'm just like, how are you doing, right? We don't do that as human beings. We turn. And, but the Bible tells us that these animals, you know, don't turn. They go straight all of the time. Now, here's the thing. When you got four faces facing in every direction, and you've got eyes all over your body, you can just go and whatever. So they never turn. You know, however they move, they just move this way, and they move that way, and they move forward, and they move back. And, and, and they're always facing you because, you know, whatever face is facing that way, they're like, hey, brother, how you doing? And then it's like, hey, brother, how you doing? You know, whatever. And they've got these faces, but the Bible tells us they never turn. They only ever go straight. And I'm sure there's a spiritual application there. You know, as, as Christians, we should always go forward. You know, don't, no turning back. But look, look at verse uh, 14, another, another verse about their movement. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance, notice, of a flash of lightning. So they're, they, they're, they're supernaturally fast. They're fast, you know, they, they go there and they come back and it happens in a flat, like a flash of lightning. So they're, they, they, they never turned, you know, they're always going forward, whatever direction they're going. And whatever they're doing, they're doing it fast. 
like the flash of lightning. Uh, of lightning. Notice Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 25. We're going to try to finish this up. We're going to look at Ezekiel. We're going to go back to Revelation. We're going to go back uh, to Isaiah, and we're going to go to Exodus 25, if you want to just find Exodus 25. But let me, let, let, let's finish this chapter up. Look at verse 25. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 25. And there was a voice from a firmament that was over their heads when they stood and had let down their wings. And above the firmament that was over their heads was... I want you to notice these words, the likeness of a throne, the likeness of a throne, as the appearance of a sapphire stone, and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness of the appearance of a man above upon it. So he sees a throne, and he sees a man on this throne. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about. So he sees this man, but he doesn't really see the man. He just sees fire, you know, up and down uh, his body. Look at verse 28. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain. All right, what is that? That's a rainbow, right? He says that he sees the appearance of a bow in the cloud in the day of rain. So was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice as one that spake. Just real quickly, go to Revelation chapter 4. Remember, we've been looking at that scene of the throne in heaven in Revelation chapter 4 with the seraphim. I want you to notice that in Ezekiel 128, he sees this throne, and he says, I saw the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain. Well, that is also mentioned in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in the heavens, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show you things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. Right? That's what Ezekiel saw. A throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a, don't miss it, rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. So both John and Revelation saw a rainbow round about the throne, and Ezekiel saw the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain around that throne. So we're looking into the throne room in heaven. You know, it's a shame today that the rainbow has become the symbol of perversion. You know, like Brother Stuckey says, we need to take the rainbow back, all right? It's a symbol of God's judgment. And you, when you see and walk into the throne room of God, you see the rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Now, I want you to understand this. When we study Ezekiel chapter 1 and we get all this description of the cherubims, it's not about the cherubims. It's about the God of these cherubims. Go to Exodus 25, just real quickly. Exodus 25. We're almost done. Exodus 25. Look at verse 16. Remember when God had them build a tabernacle, had them build all that furniture? Remember the Bible tells us that all of these things were done as a shadow. Everything that was done on earth, the tabernacle, the ark, the, the candlesticks, all the, the tables, the sacrifices, all of that was a shadow of heavenly things, the tabernacle in heaven and the mercy seat in heaven. Well, there's the ark of the covenant. Remember in the holy of holies, the tabernacle, if you remember from our study in Exodus years and years and years ago, uh, you know, you've got the tabernacle, there was two sections to it. There was the holy section and then there was the holy of holies. It was separated with a curtain and only the high priest was allowed to go into the holy of holies once a year to make the sacrifice of atonement. And in that holy of holies was the ark of the covenant some of you only know about this from you know a movie or something but there's actually an ark of the covenant that god had to make and i want you to notice how he had to make that in exodus 25 and verse 16 it says and thou shalt put into the ark exodus 25 16 the testimony which i shall give thee and thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold. Of beaten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat, and make one cherub on the one end, and the other cherub on the other end, even of the mercy seat, shalt thou make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. So God had them build this ark, 
You know, and it had the word of God, and it had Aaron's uh, uh, rod that budded, it had uh, manna in there, and the ark represented the presence of God. And on the ark, there was a mercy seat, there was a seat, a throne. And on that seat, then you had these two cherubs that covered it with their wings. Now, what's interesting, and again, this is just something for you to think about, we, not theology or dogmatic at all, but in, if you remember in Exodus 28, Satan was called a covering cherub. You know, it might have been that there was originally three cherubs that covered this thing, and one fell because he was so close to God, he wanted to be like God, and we don't know that for sure, but just something to think about. But there's these cherubs, and their wings cover the mercy seat, verse 20. And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings. And their faces shall look one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark. And in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. Verse 22. And there I, this is God speaking, will meet with thee. See, God would meet with the high priest on that mercy seat on the Day of Atonement. And of course, they would have sacrificed and they'd sprinkle blood upon that mercy seat, but God would meet there. And God had them in that place that represented his throne, his, his, his uh, seat where he met with them. He had them put these cherubims. You say, why did God have them do that? Because when you look up to heaven and you see the actual throne of God and the actual mercy seat, he's got these cherubims or these seraphim or these angelic creatures, you know, that are worshiping him, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Go, go, to, go back to Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel. See, this is not a vision about cherubims primarily. It's a vision about God. And of course, I'm not saying that he saw God or he saw God the Father or whatever. No man has seen God at any time. We understand that. But he's, he's getting a vision of, you know, the throne room of God. And he sees the throne. He sees the rainbow. And he sees these animals. Exodus 1.28 as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Now I want you to notice the only response that we ever get when someone comes into the presence of the glory of God. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face. And I heard a voice of one that spake. And that's what we're going to pick up next week as we continue his vision. But I want you to notice something. Here's what's interesting to me. Ezekiel saw the heavens were open. He saw a whirlwind on fire. He saw a whirlwind on fire with cloud and brightness. He didn't run and hide. He didn't fall on his face. He did what you and I do when we see a car accident, right? He stared. Started taking notes. I'm going to write this down. This is going to get me in the Bible, you know? And he started writing. And then he sees these four creatures flying out of this whirlwind. He didn't run and hide, he didn't get scared. He said, man, I better write all this down. Look at those things. Four wings, four faces, hoofs for feet. I mean, the eyes everywhere, wheels. I can't even explain it. He, 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 he explains all that. But I want you to notice, when he got a vision of God, when he got a vision of the glory of God, he couldn't stand there and watch. He had to fall on his face before God. Because, see, it's not about the cherubims. It's about the God of the cherubim. It's not about the greatness and power of these beasts. It's about the greatness and the power of God. And when anyone ever gets a real view of God, there's only one proper response, and it is to humble yourself before that mighty God. Go to Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. We'll finish right here. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. Notice what he says. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. Isaiah got a similar vision, like Ezekiel, a little different, but a similar vision. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1, notice what the Bible says. In the year of the King Uzziah, in the year that, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, 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 is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, notice, the only response. Look, whenever you get a view of God, high, 
holy and lifted up, you will only have one proper response. You will either fall on your face before him, like Peter to the Lord Jesus Christ when he realized who it was that he spake with, or you'll do like Isaiah. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. You know, as Christians in the United States of America, we often deal with pride. You ever notice that? We're often very proud people. We think we accomplish a lot. We think we do a lot because we have nice buildings and nice vehicles and nice this and nice that. But you know, if you ever got a real vision of God, if you ever understood who God really is, if we ever, I'm not saying physically like these men did, but just in a spiritual sense, got a real view of God and realized that God is high and holy and lifted up, we would all fall on our faces in humbleness to that God and serve Him. Because it's not about the cherubims. It's about the God of these cherubims. Someone said that the book of Isaiah expresses to us the salvation of the Lord. The book of Jeremiah expresses to us the judgment of the Lord. The book of Daniel expresses to us the kingdom of the Lord. I hope you'll join us for the next 48 weeks as we study the book of Ezekiel that expresses to us the glory of the Lord and the glory of the God that we serve. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for allowing us the privilege to study a book like the book of Ezekiel. And Lord, we realize that today this book is often, often mocked and ridiculed. It's often ignored. People don't want to study it. They don't want to learn about it. But Lord, I pray you to help us.